put your hands together, please, for Jeanette Pierce. Thank you. Um, I don't know how I got this short straw to go after all of these amazing people and stories. Um, but I, I guess I, I, I'd like to start with the question that's been part of my life since before I was born, which is, why Detroit? Why, why would you want to live in Detroit? And it's a question that my parents got asked when they bought a house, a new house in Detroit in 1979, and they could have bought it absolutely anywhere. And they bought it in Detroit, and they got that question a lot. Um, and their answer was um, from everything from, well, it's a beautiful brick house, to we want to be close to amenities like Ball Duck Park or Belle Isle, or even close to getting downtown to a Tigers game. Um, but most importantly, we want to be part of a diverse community that cares about each other. Um, and so that answer to that question before I was even born has been the theme that has gone throughout my life. That house was uh, bought in 1979 in Morningside on the east side. Where are my east siders? <laughs> Woo! Um, don't worry, west siders, we'll get to you a little bit later. Um, and I am the youngest of five kids. Uh, so, and I guess I've, I think what we've learned from tonight is that my mother was probably also crying when she found out she was pregnant <laughs> with her fifth child. Um, but I think she's probably pretty happy about it uh, now and is also here tonight. Um, and we were all overachievers. We played sports, we did great in school. I mean, and I, being the youngest, had to compete with all my siblings. So, I mean, I played four sports every year. I played four sports in one season. When I was in seventh grade, I was playing AAU volleyball, AAU basketball. This is the spring of my 13th year, and I'm playing AAU volleyball, AAU basketball, softball for my school, and track for my school because I needed a girl to throw a shot. So, so, and I would go to four practices sometimes in one day. I was also on student council, got straight A's. I even at one point joined the stamp club because it was the only club I wasn't part of, and I couldn't have that. Um, so this is my life. Uh, I continued throughout high school. I got a full academic scholarship to college and was still involved in everything. And I went away to Grand Rapids, to Aquinas College. Uh, I was, hey, full ride, I'm gonna do that. And hey, it's at Grand Rapids. It's the second biggest city in Michigan. It'll be just like Detroit. Um, so that was uh, a little bit of a culture shock, especially in 1999, right? Um, so I mean, I was, uh, we'll, get, we'll come back to that too, but a little culture shock. Um, but I was getting burnt out. I was involved in all this stuff and I was dreading going to that meeting or that play practice and I wasn't happy. And I felt a little cheated kind of. I, I felt like, like there had been this unknown um, promise, this unwritten promise that said, if you do all these things, if you're successful and you do the extracurricular and you get the grades and you get the scholarship, that then happiness is the reward at the end of all of that. And that wasn't the case. And I had all these plans that, you know, that's overachieving. I'm gonna get this great job, make a bunch of money, be really successful, it's gonna be awesome. And I was questioning all of that. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so at 20, I was having this, I guess, hopefully quarter life crisis, maybe. Um, uh, and I decided to go do a study abroad program in Spain. And I hadn't taken Spanish in two years. So it was a big leap of faith. And for me, it was gonna be almost like my own Walden. I just wanted to get away from everything I knew and have some time to figure things out. So I, I go and I live, and the program was in Malaga, which is in the southern coast of Spain, about a half a million people. Picasso was born there, pretty cool place. But just not super big, like Madrid or Barcelona. Um, and we, I, I get there at the beginning of September. It's a new, exciting experience. And within a week of being there, I mugged by eight guys. My friend and I had been walking home. Uh, ironically, we had walked a third friend home uh, after just some studying. And as we were coming back, um, we were attacked. Um, and now it's become a joke, right? Hey, I lived in Detroit my whole life. I went to Spain, I was there a week, I got mugged. Um, but at the time, it was anything but, right? It was the scariest moment of my life to that point. And, that, and the vulnerability that I felt was a level I had never felt before. That, that moment when 
you, when there's a possibility, and I told my friend, she tried to get my purse back, and I said, it's not worth it, let it go. And that moment of what, what's not worth it? Well, your life, my life, like, that that could have been the outcome. Um, and it was extremely scary. But we also talked about it. We didn't blame Spain. We're not like, we're never going to Malaga. Spain's awful because this bad thing happened to us. In fact, it, you know, there was some silver lining. If you're gonna get mugged, um, Spain's not a bad place to have it happen. Um, I mean, eight guys, um, none of them were taller than six feet or more than a buck 80. Um, so, and you know, in America, that's, you're gonna have really, you're just gonna be one big dude at least, right? Uh, also, no guns, um, which was super helpful. Um, but still, but still really scary. Um, and just two days later, was September 11th, 2001. So to say it was a rough week is kind of an understatement. The vulnerability and that fear and that just everything you know and thought about the world as kind of a child was stripped away from me on every level. Um, I had been studying international politics though at that time and was able to find some solace in helping others that I was with understand a little bit about what was going on in the world. And that was one of the times that I realized that helping others um, actually can help me through process things as well. Um, and it really taught me that I could handle anything. The strength that I felt, I felt so strong after all of the, that week because I'm like, bring it on world. If that's what you got, I handled it. And I, and I can do anything from here. And I took that time, the rest of the time in Spain to to do the examination and thinking and talking with people, walking places, stopping and talking to the cafe owner, um, and realizing that you don't have to join a club if you like to do something. In Spain, they might just, if you like to play chess, you play chess with your friends in the park, not join a bi-weekly meeting club, you know, and, or you get you know, rewards for it. Um, and it really changed my entire life's view. And it was actually really difficult to come home because I loved what my life had become, that I wasn't living my life on automatic pilot anymore. And, but I wanted to come home because I loved my family and I loved my city, but I wanted to bring what I loved about Spain with me back home. And so I decided uh, I was gonna take those small pieces and make it happen here in Detroit. And it was 2003, I graduated college and I moved downtown and I haven't driven to work since. And that was 15 years ago. Uh, which in the, I got rid of my car seven years ago, which in the Motor City, uh, talk about crazy, we'll come back to that too. Um, but what was amazing was that as I started walking places, and I was like, I know Detroit, I've lived here my whole life. And then I started walking places going, what's that? Uh, I've never noticed that before. And what's this place? And wait, how did I not know this? That first time when you walk into the Guardian building and it's literally jaw dropping and then learning and, and I wasn't Googling it on my phone. I actually carried the AIA guide to Detroit architecture in my purse. So if I ever saw something I had a question about, I could look it up. Um, and I'd be like, wow, Rookwood Tile from Ohio, that's, that's like not our local Pulavic Tile or the Monell Metal or the Tiffany Glass Clock or the horsehair underneath the ceiling that uh, dampens the acoustics. I mean, amazing. Or going into places that have been here forever, walking into the Anchor Bar, sitting down, talking with the bartender, hearing some great stories, find out that that's the owner of the bar who's third generation and his grandfather started it in 1959. And how did I lived here my whole life and not know this? And then as an East Sider, discovering this whole other side of town, the West Side. <laughs> how do you pronounce it? Is that Finkel? Or uh, what is this Grand River um, thing? Is there a river? I'm so confused. Um, and, but every time, so I, I would go and I would learn and I would talk and I would hear from people, go to small businesses and, and every time I would learn something, I, I wanted to share it with people. Hey, did you know about uh, the Guardian Building or did you know about the Burwood Wall? Did you know about Rouge Park is 100 acres bigger than Belle Isle but doesn't get half the attention? I mean, all of these things and people were thinking I was crazy. They're like, you live where? You do? And even these were from Detroiters too. You, 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 there's nothing downtown, there's nothing in Detroit. I've been here forever, I know everything. And I'd say, well, do you know this? Or did you know that? And people would say, uh, no, actually, I did not know that. Uh, and so every time that I learned something new, I fell more in love with my city and my life. And I wanted to be able to share that with people. 
And first I checked, I was like, did I miss something? Was someone trying to tell me about this and I just wasn't paying attention? Uh, and the answer was no. There was a lot of headlines about Detroit and let me tell you about Detroit, mostly from people who did not live in Detroit. Um, even back then, right? Uh, and, but what was it like to live here? And what, and what was our experience? And what were these great small businesses that didn't have marketing budgets? How could we help people know about those things? And I did not, like some other people, want to be an entrepreneur my whole life. Absolutely not. I was like, let's, I'm gonna, I did want to work for a nonprofit. My dad had always been involved in nonprofits, and we, as kids, were really involved in the community and the city. Um, and I was working at United Way, but decided that there's someone needed to do something about this. And so a friend and I started what we called Inside Detroit. We didn't have a branding campaign or anything. We're like, hey, we're gonna give people the inside scoop. Okay, sounds good. So we launched on January 6, 2006, um, and it was a great party. And one of the most important things was that my dad was there, um, which was really important um, because he passed away a month later. Um, and I kind of feel like we had this tag team experience because he had been invested in Detroit for so long and working with nonprofits and helping nonprofits. Um, and he had the opportunity to see me start something that um, has grown into something that I, I can only imagine um, what, what he would think today. Um, and, and it did, it grew. Uh, I eventually I quit my day job, which is a big leap to make, that I was making $24,000 in 2005. <laughs> so do the math on that. Actually, it was 2008 by then, by the time that was coming around. A little bit of difference, but it still was a lot, it still felt like a lot of money. Um, in fact, the leap was when I asked for a raise and they said no. And I was like, it turned out to be a great thing because it made me make that leap. Um, we got space on Woodward to open the first brick and mortar welcome center in the history of Detroit. I mean, that's mind boggling. We, when we had two million people, we didn't have a brick and mortar. Thank you. I called it our MacGyver Welcome Center because we didn't have any money. I should have mentioned when I was starting this, um, all of these lovely programs, Prosperous and Build Institute and NEI, did not exist, okay? Um, we had some great support from uh, some great people, um, but I wish some of the resources that are available now uh, were available then. The term social entrepreneur was not, a, not around or used. Um, the Welcome Center was really a pop-up, but they didn't use that either. It was just like, you can have this space for cheap until someone better comes along. Um, <laughs> And we paid $500 a month for 3,500 square feet on Woodward Avenue, where Nike is today, wow. plus utilities. And, uh, and wow, everyone's like, that's so cheap. It wasn't cheap to me, because I just quit my job and was having to pay $500 to $1,000 a month out of what we were making um, for rent to have the first welcome, because we thought the city needed a welcome center. And it was our MacGyver welcome center, because we didn't have money to deck it out. It was, hey friend, I'll give you some beer if you paint the place. And hey mom, that table in the basement could be really useful. And hey artist friend, you're good with metal. Can you make a shelf out of this scrap stuff? Um, but I like to say it was kind of like Detroit, not fancy, but we had tons to offer. Um, and then we did grow and we did get some support and got to be part of a, a three-year collaborative project called Dehive, where we took what we were doing with the Welcome Center and tours. Some people have heard of it, that's awesome. Um, and got to add amazing programming like Detroit, like the um, entrepreneurial resources that have because become Build Institute and many other things. We also got to have branding support, so we got to do all that, and that's when we got the brand Detroit Experience Factory. We build experiences for locals, really focusing on locals to learn more about their community. Um, and then we moved over to Monroe, so the address now, the Welcome Center is 123 Monroe. And um, there were some times, I mean, we've all talked with all the entrepreneurs about the struggles. When I quit my job to do this, I was broke um, for a really long time. And, but I, sometimes I didn't feel as broke as I was. Like when I got my, you know, my, at the end of the year, how much you made, I was like, really? Like I knew I was broke, but I did not know I was that broke. <laughs> um, but part of that is because, you know, yeah, I love Detroit but Detroit loves me back and that community, right? So that, that free drink at the bar or that event that I get invited to where I get the free food, those are really helpful things um, for a long time. Um, but today we have 
uh, seven full-time staff, 30 part-time tour guides, and we just took our 100,000th person on tours of Detroit. Thank you. Um, and it's amazing to think about how far we've come and that it's not a tour. People think tour and they think double-decker bus. Wah, 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 wah. Um, and that is not what we do. Uh, how many people have been on a tour? I gotta, okay, awesome. Um, and if you haven't, you should come because it's not about the sightseeing. It's about what you already know and taking that to the next level. It's teaching the east side about the west and the west about the east and everybody about southwest because sometimes they get forgotten. Um, and, and on the small businesses and, and these stories that we've heard today, going into their businesses, going into their nonprofits, uh, and hearing about all the great things, the people, places, and projects in Detroit. And that's our mission, is to educate locals and visitors about Detroit's history, neighborhoods, innovation, in order to promote inclusive prosperity. That, that's really what it comes down to, economic impact for everybody here in Detroit. So I really hope that you get a chance to come on a tour. But at the end of the day, it hasn't been super easy, but I have got to do what I love. Not only have I been able to do what I love, the city and this dream of mine brought me my love as well. I actually met my husband on a tour. Um, and it was pretty great. Um, we got engaged at the Historical Museum at the Weddings of Detroit exhibits. And then we decided to have our wedding to celebrate our love for each other, but also the love for our city. And we got married in the middle of Campus Marshes Park and invited the whole city. We had Thornada Davis and RJ's Rhythm Rockers and the Sights and the Hard Lessons and 800 cupcakes from On The Rise Bakery. Uh, and we just celebrated all of the love that we have for each other in the city. Um, I'll tell you some of the things along the way that have been difficult. I didn't know anything about finances or financials. I'm still working on that even. Um, fundraising is still like, the, I'm like, I'm used to problem solving A plus B equals C. Fundraising's like Q plus some coding plus some, I don't even know. Um, and we're you know, still trying to get, get stuff to happen and support the Welcome Center. So there's still a struggle every day. Um, but at the end of the day, the question that started at the beginning of my life and really led me to start an entire organization because everybody thought I was crazy and was asking why Detroit uh, is, is still there. The answer that I always tell people is that we have all the big city amenities that you could possibly imagine. We have the second largest theater district in the entire country, 13,000 in a two block radius, second only to New York. We have four major sports teams, three stadiums right downtown. We have amazing world-class museums that people take for granted sometimes, but they are absolutely amazing all right around here. We have public spaces, like you can't believe, we take those for granted too. I mean, Belle Isle, Rouge Park, Campus Marches, the Riverbank, I mean, I can walk to Canada for heaven's sakes, right? We also got two countries to so the price of one. Um, there are, yeah. And there are over 700, I think our current list, we keep a list of every single bar, restaurant, or coffee shop in the city, not counting fast food. I think that's currently at 735 places. And there's 160 downtown, but there's also all throughout the neighborhoods, and 95% of them are locally owned small businesses. And none of those things are my favorite. My favorite thing about Detroit are the people, are the stories are the fact that we know our neighbors and we know the owners of the bars and restaurants and shops because they frequently are our neighbors. That the idea of neighbor doesn't mean they live directly next to you, but that we have this idea that you can be a West Sider and I can be an East Sider, but we've, we feel like neighbors. Because what we have in common is this desire to be a part of something bigger, right? And that's the one thing too that I see where people who have been here and the newcomers, for the most part, are really wanting the, to be a part of something bigger and know their neighbors, and that brings people together. And they really want to have a positive impact on where they live. And in Detroit, that's possible. And the way that I sum that up in one very you know, pithy phrase is that Detroit is big enough to matter in the world, but small enough where I can matter in it, and where you can matter in it, and where each of us can matter in it. And I wouldn't live anywhere else. Thank you.
Jeanette Paris, ladies and gentlemen.